in our country and uh, throughout our communities. We are experiencing a lot of problems and challenges in our communities and people stand on different sides of the fence on opinions. But I'm glad on nights like tonight that we can have an opportunity to talk about unification and coming together and embracing forgiveness. And I am honored to work closely with the anti-racism team of the library. The library is very excited about our social justice work that we're doing to help support our community. And we are just very honored right now to get ready to introduce to you and present to some our guests for tonight, all the way from the city of Benton Harbor, Michigan, Mr. Andrew Collins and Jamil McGee. I didn't wake up one day and say, you know what, I, I want to be a corrupt police officer one day. So yeah, so I grew up in a home that was uh, pretty volatile, had some domestic violence in it. It was pretty common that every weekend, mom and dad would go out partying and they'd come back fighting because someone was looking at someone the way they shouldn't have been looking at them. And, and one night, a police officer got called. This man in my life, my dad, who had been a monster in my mind, I was just little and I see him do some awful things to my mom. All of a sudden, he's cowering, and it wasn't because the police officer was mean or aggressive, it was just because he was there. He brought peace to my home. And I remember after that night, I knew, always knew, that's what I was going to do. I was going to be a police officer. I wanted to bring peace into people's homes. My growing up was a little different. The home was quite not the typical home, but it was, it was a home. It was abuse in our home. My aspiration, my goals was to be somebody different. My son, he was just born. He was only a few days old and uh, his mom was going to bring him to, uh, for me to see him for the first time. Sitting there chilling and then I get this phone call. My uh, baby mother is going to bring my son over and I'm like, okay, yeah, great. So now I'm like, I got to go to the store. I'm going to get some milk and some things so I will have to leave. And coming out the store, <coughs> this guy at the time was approaching me, talking about he's a cop. And me coming out of the store, I'm just trying to walk around him still. And he's telling me this. And I'm like, I don't care who you is, I'm getting around here. And he's like, no. And he flipped out the badge on me. And I was like, oh, OK, this is real. What you want? And he's like, where's the dope? I'm like, I don't have any dope. He's like, well, yeah, you do. Well, you got some for me. And at that point, I'm like, I don't. So he searched me twice and there was no drugs. He went back to the truck I was in. The guy was still in the, well, he was outside the truck at this time. The guy that was the driver of the truck that I caught the ride from. And Andrew went over there, well, the officer went over there and- um, It was me. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't him then. <laughs> yeah. Spoiler so alert. He, <laughs> he, he went over there and came back. And at this time, he wanted to search me again. And I'm like, oh man. So this time I pulled off my pants and kicked off my shoes. So I'm halfway nude out here. And I'm like, I don't got anything. And at that point, um, I was placed in the car. And it's like, yeah, you're going, you're going in. So, but the officer in the car was like, hey, just calm down. If you ain't had nothing to do with this, you'll be all right. Just chill out. You'll be all right. You'll be fine. And I'm like, all right, I'm cool. So he goes back, he's, he comes back, and he has the baggie, and he shakes it in the window, and was like, I got you. And I'm like, nobody care about none of that. that, ain't got nothing to do with me. I'm trying to get home, so I don't miss this lady bringing my son. And I never got to that place. I never got home. I went there to jail, and two weeks later, I was being <laughs> indicted. Um, and while I was in jail, the first two weeks, I'm in jail under somebody else's name. Like, it's not me that is on the paperwork. It's somebody else. And then a the guy come to my cell and was like, you're not who we're looking for. And he leaves. Then the next day, I get a paper slid under my door a supplemental report saying that everything that they had this other person, which was me, in jail for, <laughs> was now changed to my name. 
So I'm like, oh man, this is, this can't be true. This can't be real. I end up doing, getting sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. Uh, the day that Jamel and I met for the first time, I had caught a guy with, with some crack cocaine uh, right around the corner. And uh, I told him the same thing I told everybody. You want to go home, you want to go to jail. And I said, man, I want to go home. I said, all right, order up some more for me. So I listened to a phone call. He made a phone call, ordered up an ounce of crack cocaine, and told me this is the vehicle that they'll be in or he'll be in, and this is the location. And then we waited and waited, and then there was a phone call, and he said, okay, you're good. So I went to the location, and sure enough, there's the vehicle, just like I was told it was going to be. And there was one guy in the vehicle, and as I approached the vehicle, another guy comes out of the store. And it was early enough in the day that not a lot of people were around, so I thought, maybe he's got something to do with this. I'm not quite sure if he does or not, but I'm pretty sure he does, so I gotta make sure that by the end of the day, he does have something to do with it. If in fact he has, if he's the one that brought it, I need to make sure that I bridge this gap, is basically the way I thought it. And he started walking towards the vehicle, so I said, okay, this has gotta be him. So I approached him, and just the way he said it went down, that's how it went down. I acted as if I knew he was the guy I was looking for. I had been given a street name of who I was looking for, and I assumed that's who it was. I said, this is him, I gotta get him. I ended up finding an ounce of crack cocaine in the vehicle, just like I was told I was going to, and said, okay, I got my man. I got him and I got his partner, Think that's what I'm thinking. So I lock him up under that name. Yeah, way to go me. Two days later, I get a call from the FBI saying, hey, that's, that's not him, that's a different guy. What happened? And I said, ah, you know how it is. There's, there's so many street names out there because the guy I was looking for went by one name, but this guy is actually Zuki. And because and, that's what Jamel goes by, is Zuki. That's his, that's his yes. uh, grandma gave him that name. <laughs> grandma gave you that name. And uh, so I just wrote a report and said, you know what? I know that I said this name, but really what I meant was Zuki. And that's just an honest mistake by a police officer. Just lied, completely lied. I've got to do what I've got to do to make sure I get this conviction because he's the bad guy and he has to go to prison. So I lied. And then he took it to, to trial a couple months later. And I'm thinking, what? Trial? I wrote that report really well. I don't know why you're going to take it to trial. So I got up and I swore in front of the judge and, and lied in federal court. You should believe me, I have a badge, basically is what I was playing off of. Guilty. 10 years in federal prison. I didn't think about Jamel a whole lot after that. I went about my business. And I started doing more bolder and more bolder things. See, when I started at 21 years old, I had these high hopes of being a peace officer. And by 22, 23, I had learned that you had to, be, you had to walk a line a little bit because I was taught that criminals are really smart because they've been through the system. So sometimes you got to bend the law a little bit. You don't break the law, but you bend it a little bit. So I started allowing myself to bend the law. I'm telling little fibs. I'm creatively articulating my reports, if you will, but I swear I'll never steal money from people and I'll never plant dope. Those are two things I'll never do. I had those rules for myself. And I tell you, by the end of my career, I was stealing money from people and I was planting dope. Because once you take that first step towards losing your integrity, the next step isn't so bad. And then the next step isn't so bad. And before you know it, you're on this slippery slope that you never thought you could be on. I had lost so much of myself that I didn't know where 21-year-old Andrew ever went. That guy who, who wanted to help a community, I was addicted to people saying, it's Collins, that's Collins. I loved that. I, I was addicted to myself, I tell people. And that led to my downfall. One day I was caught. Crack cocaine, heroin, and marijuana in my office. One of the crazy pieces of the story is the original crack that I caught on that dude who made the phone call that led to Jamel being in the car. That same crack I pulled off that guy is the same crack I got caught with. Yeah, right? What were you Poetic doing with it, justice. right? Yeah, yeah, justice, right? There's a lot of things that tie me and him together that God saw fit to, to tie together. So I tell people I went on a three-day journey, thought about, or got caught on a Tuesday, my whole life crumbled. I was making $60,000 a year at the police department, working a lot of overtime. That salary was gone. I was stealing money from people too. That money was gone. It, overnight, everything that, that I was told that you're supposed to have as a young man in America was gone. I still had a payment for my car, my house, my credit card, the other credit card, the credit card that's paying for those two credit cards. All those payments were still due, but now I had no money coming in. My friends, gone. 
So I said, you know what, I can't. I got to check out. There's nothing I can do here. So day one got caught, day two thought about suicide. That's it. It's over for me. All right. What's up? What do I need to do? And at first, I got to be honest, this was rough for me. It was a battle because God studies saying every day, let this go. I got you. This is my battle. I got it if you will let me. But me, I'm like, nah, this is my pain. This is my hurt. This was done to me. So excuse me, God, I hope you don't mind, but I need to take care of this myself. Um, that was my attitude. That was my goal. So I had set a goal for myself to when I came home that to find him and harm him. That was my goal. So God, in that moment, I, I walked out my room and went on the yard. And I walked in around this circle and it was just like, I began to reflect on my life as a whole from as far as I can remember until the present. And I realized like, man, you had a choice. Before every and each interaction, you had a choice. But I chose the easy, the more convenient way every time. And those ways led me into the very places that I was standing in. I got back to the unit and she was approaching the door. The guy was like, man, you know they've been calling you all day. You should probably go see what they want. And I'm like, oh man, I'm finna go to the hole for some stuff I did months ago. And it caught up with me. So I'm like, okay, it's time to face the music. It is what it is. So I get there in the office, and he's like, where would you go if you were released today, tomorrow, six months from now? And I was like, probably in my grandma's house. And he was like, oh, all right. He was like, I need an address. So I gave him the address. And he was like, you got 15 minutes to leave. And I was like, wait a minute. I was like, I can leave out your office right now, because I didn't need to be in here five minutes. So. He was like, hold on, and he, the fax machine beeped, and the paper came out, and he was like, no, like he handed me straight the paper and was like, read it, and I read it, and it was a letter from the judge saying that my conviction was overturned, and that I had to leave the premises immediately. So, <laughs> yeah, God works in a serious way, so, you know. And sometimes he forgets to mention. When you woke up that morning, how many years did you have left on your sentence? Yeah, it was six years left. So many of us, I listen to Jamel's story, I've heard it a few times, and I'm, I'm blown away every time that God speaks to me that sometimes we keep ourselves in mental prisons that don't have an out date. Six more years, God, until my baby's out the house and I can be out this relationship. That might be someone's truth today. Six more years till I can retire. Six more years before I'm out of the house and I don't have to deal with mom and dad anymore. Now, there was something physical that was going on at the same time, and that was the longer I was away from police work. I don't know if you ever got caught and you kind of just felt, you felt sorry you got caught. Like, I am so sorry I got caught. <laughs> and then the longer I was away from it, it turned to, no, I'm really sorry for what I did and how far I left my old past behind, because that's not who I was when I became a police officer. So the longer I was away, the longer or the more I realized I had done some really awful things to some, some people who didn't deserve it. So I eventually went to the FBI, and I said, look, I just want to tell you all the truth. I don't want to hide from this anymore. I mean, they thought I had money in offshore accounts. It was good I came to the table, because they were way off. And I said, I just want to be truthful. And they laid a stack of papers in front of me and said, let's go through your drug cases, and let's, let's highlight the ones that are bad. And I said, honestly, at this point, it'd be easier to highlight the ones that are good. My corruption ran deep. And we just started going through and talking about the cases. And in that pile was Jamel McGee. I said, I lied. That part right there, I lied. So I, I pled guilty January of 2009. And a week later, Jamel got released. So it was like tag team. I'm going to come in. You can go out. <laughs> Now, that still doesn't explain why we're here and he's not punching my face off. Because let's be honest, that's what a lot of us are feeling right now. So I get out in 2010, and in 2011, my church is doing this thing called H3, Hoops, Hip Hop, and Hot Dogs. Three of the most beautiful things in the world. And 
And I felt like God was calling me back to the city of Benton Harbor to be reconciled, that he called me back to the place I harmed because it was my duty to say I'm sorry to some folk. So I'm standing in, in Broadway Park, which isn't the most safest place for an ex-police officer to be standing. But there's all this fun going on, hundreds of kids having a blast, and I'm standing by the snow cone machine, securing it to make sure nothing bad happens. And if they need taste testers, I got you. And there was just, there was a lot of responsibility at the snow cone machine. <laughs> and up walks this man, uh, he was coming at me. He wasn't coming to me. He was coming, it was like, he wasn't running, but like, I, I, like the power walkers, like he was coming. <laughs> And I'm trying to think, who is it? I know, he looks so familiar, he looks so familiar. What's his name? He said, you remember me? And I said, Jamel McGee. But he reached out his hand, I shake it. I'm thinking, this is gonna be, and then he squeezed it extremely tightly <laughs> to the point of almost breaking it. And, and he said, I want you to tell my son why he missed out on four years of his daddy's life. And his son was standing right there next to him. And I said, there's nothing I can say that gives you back that time. What I can tell you is I was a messed up individual. I was a jacked up person. I was addicted to myself and, and full of my own self. I'm sorry, that's all I have for you, I'm sorry. He didn't say a word. I could see the little muscles in his jaw and he didn't let me go. So I thought, oh, he must wanna hear more. Uh, so I said, I know what I'll do. I'll connect with him on a fatherly level. I said, man, and I know how it feels to be away from your baby because I missed out on 18 months of my daughter's life. Wrong. I should have never said that. That's basically like saying to your wife, I'm sorry you feel that way. That's not an apology. It basically took every apology I said to him and I ripped it back away by trying to justify or minimize. And, so, and that's happening in society right now with, with a lot of what we see. Let's just be honest for just a second. I don't usually go into this, but the black lives matter, all lives matter. When, when, when someone says, yeah, but all lives matter, you basically just say everything you just said, all the pain you feel, I'm stripping it away, and you don't get to feel a certain type of way because I say I can feel that way too. And that's exactly what I did to this man. I, I took his voice away and said, you don't have a right to feel that way and I shouldn't have done that. And he had a few choice words for me. <laughs> we won't mention those. <laughs> and he released me and walked away. Uh, what was that like for you? Yeah, that day for me was a, um, a testing day that I like to call it because it was a day that I could have did something that could have cost me dearly. Um, but I didn't. This is the day I, I finally get to meet really get into meeting my son. Um, and he wanted to go to the park, which I didn't want to go because there was too many people out there. And um, I just said, you know what? I'm gonna just stay on the sidewalk and let him run through the park. And I started walking, we started walking down there and I was just, my head was just caught under the pavilion for some reason, I just couldn't turn away. and. I thought I seen Andrew, and I'm like, that can't be him. Not in Broadway Park, not in this park. This park rough, and they're using no end well when all these people are here. And I'm like, that, that can't be him in this park. So I kept on walking, and I kept looking, and then he turned around, and I was like, yeah, that's him. Get him, and I'm gone. <laughs> yeah, and my, my, um, my heart, when I got there, that was my goal, was all the feeling, all the pain, the hate, the anger, the anger that I was feeling in prison had all came back. It was right there, it was at the whim, right there. And I got him in my hand, and my mind is telling me to hit him, hit him, hit him. You're taking too long, hit him. You know? <laughs> so, but. I don't know how fresh that gets sometimes, go ahead. <laughs> But I, I uh, and then that song I told you guys about that just wouldn't go away, it was just all too familiar. It came right back. What are we doing here? I, I, he said something else. I said some choice words and I walked away. I, I, let him I go. forgive you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I walked away. And each step that I was walking away, I felt lighter and lighter. As and, did I. Yeah, and I felt like the, it was, and I thought I would never see him again.
too. But oh, yeah. that didn't happen, as y'all can see. <laughs> um, but after that, I saw him every day. Every single day I saw him. Well, not every single day, but I saw him more days than I should. So I said, God, was I supposed to do something to him? Like, <laughs> what, was, what was the deal? But I, I knew in those moments that it was something better. It was something greater in everything. And then four years later, I, in, in between those, this four years later, I ended up hurting my hand and going through a lot of different changes. So I went to this, a, man, a bunch of different agencies. And this one lady, Miss Deborah Mead, hooked me up with this program called Jobs for Life. And I wasn't going to take the class because I could get a job. That wasn't the problem. It was just my hand would swell up and lock up so I couldn't do anything repetitious. Um, so that would cost me a lot of jobs. I'd get a job and they'll, once they find out about my hand, they'll lay me off. So at this point, I'm like, I need something to, to sustain me. And they had this class, Job for Life. I ended up taking the class and the lady that brought me down there, I was homeless at the time too, okay? And she bought me five outfits, okay? And I was confused. I was like, why is this lady doing this? Like, why would she even do this? So after that, the next day she brought me a bike. And I later learned that this was God intervening before I can even come up with the excuses. <laughs> did, did you hear it? <laughs> like, yeah. he had already equipped somebody that I was going to trust to give me everything I need so I wouldn't have no excuses. So I took the whole class and three weeks in was meet your mentor. Hmm. <laughs> so let me tie a great let me, transition. Let me tie a bow on this as we finish up. So I worked for, uh, at the time, I worked for a nonprofit called the Mosaic CCDA, and in that there was Jobs for Life. And the director of Jobs for Life comes down one day and says, hey, there's this guy, goes by the name of Zuki, you know him? And I was like, I don't think so, I've never heard the name before. And uh, she said, will you, be his <laughs> will you be his mentor? And I said, listen, you know my story, go ask him if he wants me as a mentor, and if he does, then we can, but I'm not gonna make that decision for him, because I might have done something to a family member or something, small town. So she, she goes over and has a conversation with him where he says, oh, hey, no, I'm not taking him as my mentor. And then God says, yes, you are. So then Jamel comes walking into the cafe where I work, and I'm like, oh, hey, Jamel, come on over. Have a seat. Hey, uh, I used to be a police officer in the city of Benton Harbor. I did some really stupid things. And he's smiling at me. I don't know what this guy's smiling about. I'm trying to be serious. I did some really awful things. If I ever harmed you or your family, can you let me know so I can apologize? And he was like, Bro, we already had this conversation. I said, we did? He said, yeah, Broadway Park. And I was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> I'm all about Christ, but I thought some things that day. And I said, uh, I'm sorry. And I just went to apologizing again. I felt like God gave me a second chance to apologize. And he just kept waving me off. Said, Stop it. Stop. It's over. It's forgiven. You were sorry then, and I believed you. I believe you now. You're sorry. Uh, I said, Jamal, this is crazy. Uh, can we do this mentor mentee thing? He said, I think God wants us to. I said, Can we pray? Because this is heavy. Like, literally, four minutes ago, I was making cookie dough. You know, like, this is heavy. Can we pray? He said, Let's pray. So we prayed that God would bless our friendship. This is October of last year. We're a year into this thing. He gets up and leaves. A couple weeks. Yeah. A couple weeks later, we needed somebody in the cafe to work, and I said, hey, man, you need a job. I need an employee. This, this sounds like a good deal, but are you a good employee? Because if, if, if I got to write you up, like, that makes our relationship a little weirder. And he was like, no, man, I got you. I got you. So it was like he started, and he was an amazing employee, and I was blown away at, at how he was coming out of his shell because he had some purpose in his life. And I, I thank him every day. Thank you for, for being such a hard employee. And do you want to punch me in the face? Just checking in, and he'd be like, no, man, stop it. So I used to ask him like almost daily, you sure you don't want to punch me? Because I just want to see it coming. 
And uh, so I told him there was a cake over here with our face on it tonight, which is the first time we've had a cake with our face on it. I said, I said, bro, you get a chance to smash my face. <laughs> so, so what we've learned is that, that God has called us to be ambassadors of reconciliation. And we've learned, we've learned, yeah. Crazy time for this in our society, right? White police officer, African-American individual who got wrongfully accused. There's a lot to be said here, but we've learned three things about reconciliation. Number one, there has to be an apology. That's my part. I had to apologize to Jamel. Even if he didn't accept it and cussed me out in Broadway Park, I had to apologize. And Jamel's part, and maybe your part, is you need to forgive. Even if you don't hear the apology, you need to forgive because it's eaten you alive. And he learned that about himself, is I just got to let it go. But that's only two parts. The next part is the actual reconciliation where the apology comes together with the forgiveness and we say, there it is, but how do we work this thing out? Tangibly, what do we do to learn about each other to say, what does this look like moving forward? Mr. Police Officer, get out of your car at a different time than when you're arresting somebody and just go talk to the people and say, how is your day today? Citizen from the city, go to the police officer and say, I appreciate your, your service, and I understand that not every officer is dirty. There's, that, and that's just one example. This might be at home. That's reconciliation, apology, forgiveness, and then working it out together. And we just pray that you guys take away from here and light your city on fire in a good way with this message of reconciliation. And my last little thing to put. My, my last little thing would be the forgive, the, the hurt, the pain, the anger, all of it, whether it's family, job, friends, school, whatever it is. Let God control it. Let him dictate it. Let him avenge your hurt. He can do it better than you can. Yes. He will do it better than you can. The situations that we deem the worst, what if he already made it good? All right, so y'all take that, leave it with him, and he will make the worst the best. All right, All right. amen. Thank you. I just want to briefly introduce myself. I'm not just a random person who came here. Uh, I am part of the uh, Kalamazoo Public Library Anti-Racism Transformation Team. I'm also co-executive director of ERACE, eliminating racism and uh, creating and celebrating equity. And uh, this is a really powerful story. And uh, this, is, this is what we do as anti-racism team. And in the rest of my life is how, how do we figure out how to be together? And there's so much harm going on so much harm going on, and how do, we, how do we work past that, and not just move past it, but acknowledge it? This is, we, we are harmed, you've been harmed. How do we figure out how to still be together? I first heard about your story on CBS National News. So how did that come about? I mean, how did CBS know about this, contact you, do it? We got together in October, and uh, we spoke at our uh, fundraiser for the nonprofit that we were working for. And one of the local newspaper uh, writers said, I would love to write a piece about this. So she wrote an amazing, beautiful story. And the AP picked it up, and then these people started calling, these people started calling. And that was October. In April of this year, uh, I come back from spring break, and I walked into the cafe, and somebody was like, hey, CBS called for you guys. And I was like, shut up. Because they kept, they were calling him Hollywood and all this stuff, and, and that's not how he acts, and that's not why they were, they were just kind of poking at him and stuff. And she was like, no, I'm serious, they called. So I called the number back and the lady was like, hey, Steve Hartman would love to come down and see you guys. Is it true what really happened? <laughs> I said, yeah, it's true. So she asked a couple questions and, and we answered them. And then on Monday, Steve Hartman flew in and did, a, did two days taping with us. And, and the rest has been a blur, really, because yeah. uh, it's, it's opened a huge platform for us to, to go talk. So yeah, and Steve calls every once in a while to uh, check in and see what the latest is. <laughs> Which is kind of fun, you know? Uh, and then from that, Steve Harvey's uh, uh, syndicate, they called and, and we went and did that. And, and there's more to come. Who knows what God's going to do with it? So, yeah. Yes, 
they're I guess the, the short answer is there was a newspaper article. Hi, I guess I have a question specifically for Andrew. Yeah. Um, so you talked about those little steps that kind of happened where it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm wondering if you see if there's any way to like intervene with maybe cops who are going down that path. Um, people that are going down that path, I mean, I guess that could, it could be broader than just cops, but I wonder if there's something that you experience that, um, or ideas that you might have for how that could change. Yeah, that's a great question. I, uh, we see every event we go to and speak that somebody is tiptoeing, and when I mention that, they'll come talk to us. And uh, we hope and we pray that they'll make uh, uh, different changes in their life. And there's probably somebody sitting here that's tiptoeing, you need to stop. That's not me speaking. So, um, but then with the police officers, I go and I speak at academies. Uh, I speak at uh, Kalamazoo Valley Community College every year, uh, right before the kids graduate. Uh, Michigan State Police, I've been a couple times, or once, no, twice. And um, that's my heartbeat is to, I don't think I can reach officers who are already on the way, because there's a lot of pride involved there. And I don't have the access to them there. Not a lot of departments are inviting me in. I, I, gave, I gave police work a black eye. Um, but, they, but the academies are, are very interested. And Jamel and I actually had a chance to speak to Little Rock Police Department, which was the hardest speaking engagement I've ever had. Because yeah, the police rough. officers are taught to be like stoic. So like as you speak, it's fun sometimes to see some interaction. They're just like... <laughs> and some of them are like boring holes in my soul. And I'm like, look, I ain't getting a dime for doing this. I just hope that you stop doing it is the reason I'm doing this. So, so yeah, so that's great. Yeah, we're trying. I was just going to ask Jamel, did your friends and family believe that you were innocent? No. <laughs> no. Well, some of them, but no, not a lot of them. Um, they thought I was in that, but a lot of them didn't. But most of them, they thought I was guilty. How did you feel that? Um, <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> I I just don't. I um, I kind of just I don't know. I just don't deal with it anymore. It happened, um, and the ones that believed it, I just, I just pray and just let them hopefully, well now, since all this has came about, they're, they're all like, oh man, and I'm like, see? <laughs> <laughs> and I would say too that uh, just recently we had this discussion because I heard him talking to somebody else about how my people didn't believe me. And when he was in prison or in jail awaiting trial, he knew he was innocent, but nobody would listen to him. I took his voice away from him. I didn't just take his freedom, I took his voice. That's one thing you can never take from me is my voice. You can lock me up, I went to prison, but still, people still heard me. But I took his voice away and with his family, and it was just this, this new layer of revelation of how I hurt him, was when I heard him talking about how his family didn't believe him, and I said, man, I, I stripped you of your voice. And when, we, and when we hurt somebody, when we violate somebody, that's what we do. We take their voice away. And, uh, and we were in a hallway at a hotel, and I was like, hey, man, I got to apologize. He's like, what? You've apologized already. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but I just had this realization that I took your voice away, and I need to apologize to you. And he was like, shut up. Get over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> did you have a jury trial? Yes. Yes, I did. What it was, was the jury? Um, it was all white. It was a white jury. Um, it was, um, and they were all older. So these are these were um, individuals like suburb community. Like they, I think they should pick people that's in the community, like not outside of the community that never been in no situation, never even been down that road. Um, the 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 people, if you pick them in the inner city. The people that's been through something or seeing this, um, these type of actions in their community can better service the justice system versus some people that that's living in the country, been farming their whole life, only come in the city just to go to Myers or Walmart and go back and then they're on the panel. They don't know nothing about nothing. They're just saying, you're guilty because the officer, I believe officers because 
I am taught, I know that officers, when they come around here, they're the best people in the world. And some of them even cook them dinner. So it's like, you can't, it's like how do you tell those people that this officer is wrong? You know, when they and believe, I, they, and they believe in their yeah. heart that, that the officers, that no officers, whether they're black or white, that they can do no wrong. And I played off of that, you know, when I was at trials and I knew I was stretching the truth, I knew that there was jurors looking at me because I was so young and I could see the, the moms and the grandmas in, in the jury that would just like, it was just the way they looked at me. It's just the way a couple of you look at me now, like you idiot, you were, you were a moron, but man, I kind of, kind of love you up there because you, you were an idiot, but you're owning up for it. And they would, they would like give me that look of, and I knew I had them and I knew they believed me with nothing else than my badge. They, why, would they, why would they not believe me? And it became from this, oh, awakening moment to by the end of my career, it was, I abused that, absolutely abused it. So Andrew, you, you said that you took his voice away. Um, and Jamil said that the family didn't believe him. You took something from us, well from them, excuse me. How can we voice our opinion or our thoughts when the police department shut down, the attorneys don't want to talk to us at all because of your penmanship. It was hard for us to get to you or to say anything about the case. We couldn't say anything. So when you took him, you took us. And that was that was a hurt feeling. Yeah. I was just doing a, a, a big birthday bash for us. It was right around the corner. And I had to do it all alone. It hurted me. Yeah. That's just from me. Yeah. Not from his other brothers, sisters, mom, dad. It was from me. Because that's my better half. Yeah, and I owe you the same apology I owed him is and the only thing, and we've talked before, you know, the, the only thing I can offer you is an apology. But I don't think, I don't think when, there may be some officers that wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm just going to ruin people's lives. There might be. I think people believe there's something when they're really not. It was a little explanation, I was just saying Yeah, that. no, no, no. Yeah. Um, I'm taking your voice away right now, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's me, just wanting to talk. Because... We did, we have talked, you know, we, we built the relationship. Um, I'm saying for, for future police officers doing the same thing, you know, uh, because we're black and they're hiding behind a badge, you know, black or white. It was just a hurting feeling at that particular time. We didn't grow from that, you know. We forgave each party, you know. God bless you, I'm done. I think at some level I needed to see him as a human before I saw him as a black man. And I think that's... And I think that's something that we need to deal with as a country right now too, is, is before I can see you as anything else, I need to see you as human first, with human needs first. And that goes the other way around, that, that I don't just see somebody as a badge or as a uniform, but that is a human, and they might have kids at home. They might be, you know, uh, just the same way. Not every black man is a thug. Not every officer is dirty. Right. So this, it goes both ways, you know. Um, but, yeah, I would say that it, it, how are we going to fix it is the ultimate question. Yeah. How are we going to fix it? Because we need to have police officers that we trust. Because if my house is getting broke into, bro, I ain't calling you. Because if I do, you're going to be like, what you waking me up for? Call the police, man. <laughs> so we need the officers, you know. So, no, that's a great. We need to start by talking about it. That's how. Michigan law, I know, takes away the vote from a felon. My question is, do you have that back now? I do. Yes. And what I was thinking um, about you two is the relationship that you guys have. So do you guys, family, um, get together? Yes, Our, my son, his daughter, yes, we definitely get together. We go 
Yeah, we'd have been a lot of places. <laughs> we'd have been a lot of places. Sky Zone, uh, the parks, um, swimming, every. Um, yeah, he, my, my son is 11 years old now, and uh, Drew has a daughter who's 10. Yep. Oh, and, all man. right. From the pit to the palace. Hallelujah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> oh, man, she said it too, the pit. And that's one of our illustrations that we use too uh, in, the, in the Jobs for Life is the pit. I was, I was thinking, maybe you're already doing this, but there's a lot of high school kids that uh, they do a lot of things that are borderline and they get in with the wrong friends and maybe they're innocent themselves, but you know, like you were driving with a suspended license and maybe other little things. And so I think they, if you could warn them to be careful who you, whose truck you get in or where you go and and, and warn them that they might be judged guilty by association, even if they're innocent. Yes, I, I have um, a, a nonprofit as well. It's called JUMP, Jamel's United Mentorship Program. And I definitely, even to people that's walking down the street or standing on the corner, I definitely get out, I talk to them, hey, there's something better for you. This is not the way. There's something better for you. Go to school if you're not. Get a job if you don't. Um, all my, my conversation now is to help empower our community, our people, to find God first and find your way through life. I'm curious, Andrew, when you said you sat with the FBI and went through all those cases, were there more people then that were instantly and surprisingly released? And then what, any other stories like this? Yeah, so in most cases, uh, you might have to testify to this, in most cases, people were guilty. Yeah. I just, I would bend the truth just a little bit, and the reason I would do that is when I would bend the truth, I could line my pocket with city money. And I don't like to get into all the specifics of it, not because I hide from it, but because there might be somebody in here who's a police officer that I'm gonna give an idea to, and I don't wanna do that. But by making a little one sentence in a report could pocket me $250. Because I would say I'm paying a confidential informant for the money, but I was really putting the money in my pocket. So a lot of people got off when they were really wrong. And I get a lot of those conversations like, hey, what's up, man, how you doing? <laughs> And then I get a lot of like, you're this and you're that, and I'll let them get it out, tell me about myself, and then I'll say, you want to tell the truth now? And they'll be like, ah, yeah, you're right, you know, I was wrong. And, and so most cases, it was just a fact that I, I went too far in what I needed to do, where in his case, I was convinced he was guilty. That day, I was convinced he brought that dope, and that his name was what I thought it was. Convinced. Didn't think I was locking up an innocent man. And there's even been layers of it as we've gotten to know each other that I've had to let that go. I called my mom and I'm like, mom, I put someone innocent in prison. Like I knew what I did was bad and, and I have no doubt it was bad and I've wanted reconciliation for it, but this is the legit thing. That dude was really innocent. I messed up, you know? Um, so yeah, a lot of people, 50 to 60 cases were overturned. Jamel and maybe two others were still in prison though because they were lengthy sentences. Most people got slaps on the wrist and 30 days in jail, something like that. And, and, and many of them, go ahead. Yeah, many of them, they, they, it was most majority of the guys that was involved in that, they were involved in it. Um, it's, there's no way around it. And they know who they are, they know who they was. Um, and they have since owned up. And then the ones that's still mad, they just mad because they got caught. They're still doing it right now. Um, so I just say the circumstances under which they allowed Andrew to be trained under, under um, only led to more and more of his uh, slippery slope um, because they were praising him for the things that they wanted to get done anyway um, and he was moving along the ranks and people were just going away but a lot of the people were truly involved in it. You know, if he'd have just- They went right back to doing it when they got out. Yeah, they're, and they're doing it now. I said most of them, 
And most of them are back incarcerated um, right now for the same thing that he went to jail, that he sent them to jail for, and they got out on. They're back in jail right now, um, which is, for him, is like, and for the system, that's like, man, how, it's, it's like a double-edged sword almost, because it's like, he caught this guy this year with this. They got off, all the case, the case was dropped, and now they're back, not even six months later, for the same thing. So now you got the system looking like, oh man, now we really got to just target everybody until we get it right, which is wrong. You know, take that time, take that extra precaution to make sure everything is right, that is right, that is facts, that you don't have the wrong person or you don't have the wrong idea about this situation or that your boss is not about to fire you tomorrow. Stop pre, how are you gonna say it? Calculating things. Jamal, I was interested in knowing what your son remembers about that day in the park when you met Andrew. <laughs> oh, he remember. <laughs> oh, he remember, uh, he remember it well. Um, actually, he never even forgot Andrew after that. Um, he, he just like, oh, where's Andrew? But they, now the relationship is like, he's like, where's Uncle Andrew? Like, it's, 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 it's tight like that with him. He is, he is just like me, I can say that. <laughs> like, he is just like me. Um, and he just, he just wants to be happy. He just wanna be happiness. He don't like the, the argument of the angriness. He don't, he don't do well around those circumstances, so he just wants to be all around happy. The, the situations from, all he can say is that he didn't say anything. It's like he didn't tell me nothing. It's like he'll get to that park, and he was like, he still didn't say nothing when I actually explained to my son why I was missing out on four years of his life. He was like, he didn't say anything. That's the only thing he would, he would say. <laughs> he was like, he didn't say anything, so. I just have one more thing to say. All of us here, because these two guys, they go all over and they're speaking their story, and there's a lot of people that don't like it, and there's a lot of, you know, people would like to do harm to them both. So I'm just asking if you will, before we leave here tonight, to just say a prayer yes. Yes. of their protection. Thank That's you. That's a mama, mama bear right there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one last question. Okay, I'd just like to say that I am truly inspired by both of you. Zuki, Thank you, I am so proud of you that you were able to forgive for so much. I mean, that's deep. Yes. That was deep. And yes. you, I'm inspired because you did the right thing. I mean, you started out wrong, but God didn't let you go so far that you couldn't come back. You did come back. You went deep, but God brought you out. And it reminds me of a, of a scripture that says that maybe it, this all happened for such a time as this. We need something positive. You two are positive. You know, it shows that something bad can happen. It doesn't always have to end with someone dead. So I applaud you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Jamel, you, you mentioned a nonprofit. Can you repeat the name yes. of that and how long has that been running? It's called JUMP. Um, it's Jamel's United Mentorship Program. And I've been doing it for the summer. Just started this summer. I just started at um, May. Is it May? Yeah, May. Of this, no, no June. What was that, August? It was August. Yeah, it was August then. You it's been a rough summer, summer for us. Right? Yeah, I've been so many places, yeah. So yeah, August, and it's, um, and I do it from 5.30 to 9, and it's every day I bring all the, whatever you can think of to play with uh, for the kids, hula hoops, balloons, football, kickball, soccer, skateboards, ripsticks, um, Jenga, the big, yeah, big bubbles, 
um, kickball, I mean, everything you can imagine, football, the whole nine, everything you can imagine, I bring it. Um, and then I bring hot dogs and waters also, so, because the kids got to eat. And I do this every day. And on Fridays, I would do s'mores um, with the kids. So we'll sit out there and camp, and we have a good time, man. And they get prizes, they win cash, and um, give prizes um, daily. Andrew. We were wondering uh, what exactly was the charge that was brought upon you that you only served a year for? Yeah, yeah. so originally I was looking at uh, 13 federal felonies, 22 years in prison. And um, I ended up pleading guilty to possession of crack with intent to deliver over five grams, uh, which was a mandatory minimum of five years in prison. And the day of my sentencing, the prosecutor submitted a... Um, a petition because of my cooperation, uh, because I made those things right as much as I could. And I was continuing to because people were coming out of the woodwork uh, every day, it seemed like. Uh, so the judge sentenced me to 37 months in prison. And out of that 37 months, uh, I had a partner who was a police officer who ended up uh, also going down about a year and a half after me. I was brought back to his trial uh, because he pled guilty, but then he. Um, his lawyer had some uh, math that said he only did one fifteenth of what I did. So th they brought me back to say what his involvement was. And I sat in the courtroom for five minutes and reaccounted what I did wrong. And then went back to prison and was like, what the heck was that all about? And then I got a letter from the judge saying he knocked another 13 months off my time for my cooperation there. And then with good time, I did 18 months. So, yeah. I do have a question. Um, for anything you've done wrong in your life, have you forgiven yourself? That's my question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he always gets the question, how do you forgive? And I always get the question, how do you forgive yourself? And, and the cool part about this for me is I get people who walk up and be like, man, I've done some really awful things in my life, but nothing compared to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like... I get it. Thank you for that, I think. But yeah, it's just, uh, it's basically, you just do it. If you owe an apology, you do that first. If you know you owe somebody an apology, you do that first. And then walk through the forgiveness of yourself. Jamel, did you have an opportunity to testify at your trial? No. Um, it was, man, it was decided best that I say nothing and my lawyer either. Um, the judge was threatened both that if he or I say anything, we will be held in contempt of court. Oh. Yeah. Federal court is a lot different than the state. Um, it's, it's rough. It's real rough.